This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. This is Easter Day, the day we mark the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This day is the hinge point of all history. You see, with his resurrection, Jesus opened possibilities that did not exist before that day. The events of this day are so earth-shattering that we are called up short, stopped in our busy lives to reflect on the impact of this day. Thirty-five years ago in the journal Alive Now, Richard L. Cookson wrote of Easter, The meaning of Easter is the fact that we have a new way of looking at life and death and that we are released for a new, a new style of living. Easter was and is the new day for humans. Easter is God's proclamation that there is nothing which can separate us from His love. Death, which is a part of everyday life, is not the end of God's redeeming love. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is the complete statement of the new day. Easter makes us take seriously how profoundly God participates in our lives. It calls for the acknowledgement that we are what we are in God's love. God's love has done something with us. It has introduced us to new life. Every morning we receive the grace of God. This is the evidence of the new day. Easter makes us take death seriously. We now see death because of Easter as the last experience of this life but not the last experience of a life that is eternal because of God's loving grace. Easter is the announcement to the galaxies that God has acted consistent with all that has been done before in a new and decisive way so that a new day is born, demanding our loving and faithful response. So we greet one another on this day. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. We mark this day because it is not like other days. It is the day we tell again the story of Jesus' resurrection from the dead and the promise that as He was raised, we too will be raised. It is the hope established by Christ Jesus through the cross, through His death, and then through the resurrection. We're going to read Luke's story of Easter morning from the last few verses of Luke 23 today. I hope you'll get your Bible so you can read along with me. As you're finding your Bible in Luke 23, let us listen as our parish adult choir sings for us the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. It is a song boisterous with joy at the great things God has done in Jesus. Let's listen.
Now let us turn to our scripture. You'll find it at the end of Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 50. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested, according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week at early dawn they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them, and the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the disciples. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and then he went home amazed at what had happened. God's word for God's people. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you said that if we would become your disciples, we must take up the cross and follow. I confess that in the midst of Easter joy, I cannot quite bring myself to reach out for the rough wooden beam or to welcome the nails in order to take up the cross of my own. And yet I cannot quite abandon the stirring of Easter. Like the women, I would find the spices, fling the spices for preparing the dead out of my hands at the conviction that you have made them unnecessary. I would dance with Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary in the garden at their sudden surprise and the joyful certainty that your promise of resurrection is real. Like Peter, I would gladly run through the morning on which the empty tomb was discovered to see your unneeded tomb for myself. But still, like Peter, standing beneath your unyielding gaze, I must answer your nagging question, Do you love me? Knowing that this question must not be answered by words alone, I know on this Easter morning that I do. I do love you. Lord Jesus, heal the weakness of my character, my arrogance in the face of my undoing, and my abstinence from love and loving kindness. Raise me up so that your Easter means my resurrection also. Fulfill in us your promise that you will be with us always. We pray in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, our powerful Savior. Amen. Back when TV was in its infancy, there was a police drama titled Dragnet. Joe Friday was the main character, along with his partner. They solved the crimes of L.A. in oh, 30 minutes or less, week after week. One of the staple lines in the drama came as Detective Friday would begin to ask a witness for information about the crime. The witnesses would be flustered or chatty and begin to ramble as they told what they had seen. Friday would prompt them every week, it seemed, with the words, Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Since those early days of TV, we've been in love with the idea that we've, if we could just get the facts about anything at all, then we could figure out what had happened or what was about to happen. The conviction is that the facts are all we need. The interpretation of those facts would be ah, self-evident. Across the years, we've come to realize that the truth is a weightier matter than the collected facts about any event. And yet we continue to stumble over this old assumption. As we read Luke's witness to the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, you get the idea that Jesus' disciples had been trained in the Joe Friday School for Biblical Detectives. They have all the facts about the resurrection, but they keep struggling to make sense of them. Look at the passage we've just read 
beginning in Luke 23, verse 50. After Jesus died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea asked for his body so that he might bury it. The women saw this and went to prepare spices so they could attend to the body after the Sabbath was passed. They came to the tomb on the first day of the week, bringing their spices. They found the stone which sealed the door rolled away. Like good detectives, they looked inside but did not find the body. Two men suddenly appear and ask them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you more than once that he must be crucified, but that he would rise again from the dead. They did remember his words, and they went to tell the eleven disciples. At this point, these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, had all these facts. They did all this, and they saw all this with their own eyes. By the way, notice that it was these women who became the first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. In that day of strict roles for men and women, the men would be expected to pose a risk to any guards at the tomb. Only the men would have the strength to move a stone or a body. Only the men carried weapons. Only men would testify in court. Because women were considered to be less of a threat, they were freer to move around in the days after the crucifixion. Thus the women became the first witnesses to the resurrection, while the men stayed out of sight. The women go back to tell the men of the disciples all they have seen. What follows now, according to Luke, is a series of events, which I describe as having all the facts but suffering total confusion. Throughout this period of confusion, the followers of Jesus were not going around greeting one another, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. It looks more as if they were saying to each other, what's going on, what's going on indeed? There is no certainty. There is no joy. There is only confusion and indecision. In verse 11, Luke tells us, the women went back to the men of the disciples to tell what they had seen. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. How dismissive. This verse which follows about Peter going to see for himself almost seems like an addition to save face for the most prominent disciple you could leave it out without hurting the story. And then immediately following our passage, Luke begins a long story about two of Jesus' disciples walking to Emmaus. And as they walk, they, they try to figure it out. It goes this way. And the risen Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days. And he asked them, What things? They replied the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was to be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said, He is alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Him. They have all these facts each of them consistent with the experience of the women, but they are unable to make sense of them. And then when Jesus did make himself known to them, they rushed back to Jerusalem with their good news. This time Jesus does not leave them to figure things out. He appears among the assembled disciples, greeting them, peace be with you. Again, they're startled and terrified, assuming they're seeing a ghost. With all the facts they have from the women, with all the news from the two who walked with the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus, from the evidence they have with their own eyes, you would think that they would respond with joy at the sight of the risen Lord. You'd think they would be ready to greet the world with the news, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. But it seems the best they can say is just, is it a ghost, is it a ghost indeed? In every case, time after time, there is no fact that can give them understanding. The only understanding and joy they experience 
comes when the risen Christ stops to show them himself. The women only understood at the tomb when the two men reminded them of all Jesus had told them in advance. The men on the road to Emmaus only understood when Jesus opened the scriptures to them and especially as he broke the bread with them. The rest of the disciples only understood when Jesus addressed their doubts. Perhaps this is the lesson on faith for us this Easter day. We too have assumed that with sufficient facts we might believe. We too have assumed that whenever we can grasp the situation, then we could also live by faith. But I think that Luke has a different understanding of how we come to faith. The facts are important. Luke has been careful to lay the events of Easter morning out for us. He wants to rec the record to be complete. But in every case, facts alone fall short of the task of leading those who love Jesus best to faith in the risen Jesus. We should think of the facts as our earliest teachers. They prepare us to believe. Following Christ to learn from him would continue the lessons for us. I would be very uncomfortable with a Christian faith that had no place for the facts and the events surrounding this great faith. But faith, according to Luke, comes at the point where prepared and earnest followers of the Christ encounter the living Christ. In Jesus' presence, the stories about him come alive. In Jesus' teaching, the facts lead to the great conclusion that the facts of Easter point to resurrection. In Jesus, the evidence about him leads us to the understanding that his life, his death, and resurrection address our lives. Faith in this resurrected Christ follows as the living Christ seeks us out, moves among us in the breaking of the bread, and leads us to believe. Like that long-ago TV detective, Sergeant Friday, we have lived in the foolish confidence that facts alone will win the day. We have lived in the faith that somehow we could gain enough facts to displace all our doubts and all our questions. Better yet, facts would step forward to provide us with joyful lives. But the experience of the disciples, both men and women, on the day of the resurrection shows us otherwise. They had the facts. They kept running into them and discovering these facts for themselves. The facts were important, of course. But faith did not come until these same disciples met the risen Christ in the places where they were asking questions. Meeting him there, it was enough. Meeting him there, they were moved to action. Meeting him there, they were empowered to live with a power that the world had never seen before. So hear the witness of the ancient scriptures. On Easter, the crucified Christ was raised from the tomb by the power of God. Hear the witness of those who encountered this risen Christ in their lives. And then take their claim with you as you leave this place. Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. And our lives are completely bound up in his life. Come follow Christ as his disciples. In all these ways, wait on the visitation of the risen Christ, which leads us from information to joyous, life-giving faith. Now we're going to hear a second song. The title of it is Alleluia from Mount of Olives, sung by our parish adult choir.
as we come to the, devo- the end of our devotional time today, I just want to remind you that Easter is not over because Sunday services are finished. Instead, Easter is just beginning as we now live in the light of Easter. All this time through Lent, we have been preparing, examining how we came to this point. But now that we have reached Easter and celebrate the resurrection, we're going to focus on how we live in the light of that resurrection. Therefore, I want to invite you to worship with us at Church Street United Methodist Church. Each Wednesday at noon, there is a service of worship and communion in the chapel. Lunch follows in the parish hall. We invite you to come for that midweek break. Then every Sunday at 8.30 and 11 a.m., we will have worship in the nave. That is the, the, the occasion when the, the congregation gathers so that together we may, may share this life together as we live out our confidence in Jesus Christ and our confidence that our lives are shaped by His love. Well, Now in closing, I am Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I want to thank you for allowing me to share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye. You've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Rejoice.